Today, we're going to be covering another section of the Rites and Protest IB History Curriculum. Uh, we're going to be talking about apartheid, nature, and characteristics of discrimination from 1948 to 1964. Apartheid officially began in 1948 when D.F. Milan's Victor's National Party issued a variety of laws that became essential components for the system of segregation. Its aim was to create a complete, all-encompassing system of institutionalized racism based on the complete superiority of South Africa's minority white population. The system developed into two stages, petty and grand apartheid. Throughout this presentation, it is important to note the impact of apartheid laws on non-white South Africans across every aspect of life. You can use this chart to guide your notes. Petty apartheid, or BASCAP, boss rule, arose under the terms of Prime Minister Milan, with the purpose of ensuing the complete domination, economic and political, of whites over blacks. The term BASCAP connotes a brutal subjugation of the black majority and the firm and decisive manner with, the, with which the government dealt with the anti-apartheid opposition. This stage is called petty due to the officious and fussy nature of its regulation. Grand Apartheid, initiated by H. F. Burgorth, sought to establish ideological and moral legit legitimacy for segregation in South Africa amidst global hostility. Its main objective was the complete territorial uh, segregation of the country, leading ultimately to the full independence of each of its component parts. This would enable the complete separate development of the different peoples, each within their own national jurisdiction. The official division and classification of the different racial groups in South Africa was, essential, was an essential prerequisite for the enforcement of other forms of apartheid legislation. This was solidified by the Population Registration Act of 1950. Miscegenation of sexual relationships between persons from different racial groups had had a history in South Africa, so people born into a white community would be considered white regardless of their darker skin color. However, this became unacceptable for the new NP government. The act thus created biological classifications recorded in official identity documents under three basic groups, white, colored, or bantu. It wasn't until 1959 that the country's Indian population was classified as Asian. To further organize, enforce, and classify, a race classification board was created, which developed seven subcategories of the colored race. Cape colored, Malay, Rika, Chinese, other Asiatic, and other colored. Many of these people wanted a white classification for obvious benefits. However, whenever race was unclear, a set of measurements of linguistic and physical attitudes was conducted. This included the pencil test, which was basically putting a pencil on your hair and seeing if it stuck. The segregation of population and amenities came with three major acts. The Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act of 1949 and the Immorality Act of 1950 were designed to promote the separation of the races by outlawing sexual re relations and procre procreation between the different populations. To the apartheid mindset, miscegenation was closely associated with racial degeneration and was abolished. The act made it, le made it illegal for white South Africans to marry people of other races. The law was introduced despite the fact that the problem of mixed marriages was a tiny one. Only 75 were recorded in the three years prior to the act's introduction. This was reinforced by the Immorali Immorality Act, which banned all extramarital sexual relations between whites and non-whites. The police would react to a tip-off and burst into homes in the middle of the night trying to catch the couple, and often taking underwear as evidence. It was pretty bizarre. The Reservation of Separated Amenities Act of 1953, often seen as the epitome of the petty apartheid system, provided for the strict segregation by race of all public amenities. This included hospitals, transportation entrances, and even counters. Signs stating white only became ubiquitous across South Africa. This went beyond with the Group Areas Act of 1950, decreed that the, cities, uh, the city centers were white only for residence purposes, after which people argued that no facilities 
should exist for non-whites in cities at all. So basically, all cities were for the whites, everybody else should live elsewhere. The Natives Abolition of Passes and Coordination of Documents Act of 1952, or the Path Loss Act, maintained that Africans had to carry new documents, 96 page long, which contained such information as a person's employment record, tax payments, and reports of their encounters, of any encounters that the person might, may have had with the police. It was made a criminal offense for a black person not to present his or her new passbook on the men at any time. Even children could ask for, for an, African, an African's passbook. Harassment and embarrassment permeated the African community. The passes became an excuse to increase surveillance on the black community, conduct nighttime raids, and the only response from the African community uh, just came under the defiance campaign of 1952, which uh, was to enter multiple pub public locations without the, uh, reference books. The Group Areas Act of 1950. The single piece of legislation was so important that Malan called it the essence of apartheid. It was designed to bring about the total re residential segregation of the different racial groups in their urban areas, specifically by removing non-whites from inner city areas that would henceforth be designated as white-only areas. It was based on the racist premise that Africans were a rural people in their natural states and that their permanent exposure to city life would lead to a breakdown in the social, social, in the social order. Before 1955, the Group Areas Act was mainly used to target South Africa's Indian and colored populations. Many Indians, in particular, were traders who owned small businesses in the city. These were now forced to close. Their removal was welcomed by their white businesses, business competitors, many of whom had been enthusiastic supporters of the introduction of this legislation. It was illegal for Africans to own land or property outside of the native reserves. However, the government had no intention of sending them far away because the cities be, uh, from the cities because their labor was needed for the urban economy. Rather, the plan was to relocate them to new or existing townships far from the city centers and inner suburbs, but still close enough for a daily commute to the workplace. Many towns across South Africa had so-called underdorp or mixed population areas. Major cities also contained black spots or mainly African enclaves situated in the midst of white suburbs. In this map, we see the black spots across South Africa. To deal with the problem, the government passed the Natives Resettlement Act in 1954 and the Group Areas Development Act in 1955. The authorities were now permitted to remove blacks forcibly from the magistral destruction of Johannesburg and could focus their efforts on the most celebrated spot, Sophia Town. Sophia Town was one of the few remaining parts of the country where Africans could still legally own property due to freehold, freeholds acquired prior to the Native Land Act, Land Act of 1913. The suburb was packed with a legal drinking establishment called Shibins and a music hall, a creative and cultural hub. It produced such legendary figures of the South African jazz scene as Miriam Makiba and Hugh Masakala. It was also a center of intellectual and political activity. It was the hub of Africans in South Africa. The ANC frequently held meetings and rallies there, and many anti-apartheid activists were residents of the area. The destruction of Sophia Town would strike a blow against black urban culture and against the liberation movement, of course. In January 1955, the authorities initiated the Western Areas Removal Scheme, and the forced removal of Sophia Town's residents began. Armed police were moved into the area in anticipation of the inevitable political backlash. One by one, residents were forced to load their belongings onto trucks before being transported to the Meadowlands. It was far to the south, but it would become the township of Soweto, with a population of 2 million. Even as the residents were evicted, bulldozers stood by to destroy their homes. The homes in Soweto were typically small and very cramped. They were known as matchboxes because of their basic design. They were constructed in monotonous rows, one after the other, with no inside toilets and no running water. Anywhere between 7 and 14 people would be housed in a single dwelling. Crime, or stotis, overpopulation, sanitation issues, and outright oppression marked the livelihood of these people. Here we see a comic book of Mighty Man. It was an African comic book, and he is fighting stotis which is a uh, crime in the homelands.
We also have a section for segregation and education. It was pretty much tied to the Baton to Education Act of 1953. This act made it mandatory for schools to admit children from one racial group only and brought the education of Africans under the direct control of the Native Affairs Department, headed by the apartheid hardliner, Bertworth. The Ministry of Education would only handle other races. It dispensed with the idea of a single educational model for all South African children and replaced us with a system of entirely separate school boards for each of the races. Curricular co content would be inferior for the black community. This meant basic literacy levels and rudimental technique skills for, um, for domestic service. They would only teach African children the ways of servitude. The Vantu Education Act reconciled some of the basic philosophical imperatives of Basque Gap and Grand Apartheid. The new Bantu curriculum was assigned to prepare Africans for a life of economic servitude to their white masters. It thus fulfilled the aim of promoting an institutional framework of white domination over black. The Vantu Education Act reconciled some of the basic philosophical imperative, imperatives of Basque Gap and Grand Apartheid. The new Bantu curriculum was assigned to prepare African Americans for a life of economic servitude to their whites, masters. It does fulfill the aim of promoting an institutional framework of white domination over black. Many missionary schools that provided quality education had to close or follow to this new uh, system. Here we see a graph of the money spent for white education and the money spent for African education. Christian nationalism included in the system was paternalistic and patronizing and deeply demeaning of African culture. Bantu education taught young black people that they and their communities were backwards and that they were incapable of making any progress in life outside the narrow confines of their tribal world. This enraged the ANC and resulted in a short-lived boycott that marked a short success for this group. Steve Biko was a major critic of the system. He initiated the Black Consciousness Movement with the slogan, Black is Beautiful, as a way of combating the resulting psychological self-hatred that was promoted within the Bantu education system. The slogan, No Education Before Liberation, became, a popular, became very popular in townships, and levels of absenteeism skyrocketed across uh, schools in South Africa. Young people who did attend school were psychologically brutalized by the experience. Young children could no longer share a common African experience. The Bantustan or homeland system was hailed by the NP as the flagship of Grand Apartheid, a plan to give the black peoples of South Africa their own self-governing homeland. It would transform the existing native reserves into a number of small, fully independent states. Henceforth, South Africa would be exclusively uh, an exclusively white country. The promotion of Bantu Self-Government Act of 1959, considered the most important law in the creation of the homeland system, divided, divided the African population into 10 distinct, distinct, distinct ethnic groups. It just signed a white commissioner general whose ta task was to assist them in making the political transition to full self-government in their designated area. Here we see the different, the 10 different Bantustan territories that were comprised within South Africa. The government could, not only, uh, could now argue that black South Africans were no longer its political responsibility and it accordingly abolished the already extremely limited indirect representation of Africans in the South African parliament. In 1970, the government decreed that all black South Africans were citizens of the homelands and not of the Republic of South Africa. This meant that millions of South African blacks who did not live in the homelands immediately became foreigners in their own country. The Bantustans were also led by corrupt and brutal oligarchies who basically showed no opposition or dissent. The South African government provided them with unconditional political backing as well as military assistance whenever it was required, with the partial exception of Israel and Taiwan, 
The Bantusans were never officially recognized by any country other than South Africa itself. The apartheid authorities never thought of the homeland leaders as their political equals. As with the native reserves in previous decades, the government uh, continued to use the Bantusans as a rural dumping. Um, basically, all the population that left uh, cities in South Africa were just dumped into these uh, farms in the middle of nowhere, and the land was not even fertile. 55% of the entire population of the country resided in 13% of the total land of South Africa. Here's our famous bibliography. Again, thank you to Mr. Rogers and Mr. Clinton. And we recognize the authors of all the images in this presentation.